Welcome to the University of Georgia's Three Minute Thesis Competition. My name is Meredith Welch Devine, and I'm an assistant dean at the Graduate School at UGA. I've had the distinct pleasure of organizing this competition since its inception, and I've watched students from across campus dazzle and delight audiences, first in auditoriums on campus, then at downtown's beloved Cine, and now here on the internet. Regardless of venue, each year I look forward to the opportunity to showcase and celebrate our students. It's hard to believe this is our 10th year already. And while we wish we could celebrate in person, this format does allow us to welcome in so many more of you to hear from our outstanding students. Without any further ado, I would like to introduce our Master of Ceremonies for the evening, James Hathaway. Well, thank you, Meredith. And uh, let me also welcome everyone to the three minute thesis competition here at the University of Georgia. I've been working on this competition for a number of years with Meredith and others at the graduate school, and it is incredibly difficult for me to believe that it's been a decade. But I think that's a, uh, a testament to the incredible work that our graduate students do here. And uh, I'm always so impressed by their presentations. And if you're joining us for the very first time, I think you will be as well. Obviously, we wish we could all be there together in person to celebrate this milestone together, but we'll see each other again soon, I'm sure. Before we get started, I want to give just a little bit of background, uh, particularly for those of you who may be joining us for the first time. So the three-minute thesis competition began at the University of Queensland in Australia, and competitions can now be found at universities around the world. Uh, the competition here at the University of Georgia is open to all currently enrolled master's and doctoral students, and the rules are pretty simple. Contestants have three minutes, and only three minutes, to discuss their thesis or dissertation topic and its significance to an audience of non-experts. They are allowed one static slide, uh, static meaning that they, it can't have any moving parts, it can't have any, uh, uh, any video, any flashes, any transitions, and they also must just speak in a normal speaking voice. So there's no singing, no beat poetry, any, no interpretive dance, nothing like that. Uh, the judging criteria is also fairly simple. It's broken down into two major components, comprehension and content, and engagement and communication. So the first section essentially it asks, do, do you understand what they're saying? And the second part is, did, did you enjoy uh, understanding what they were saying? So it's, it's not just about relaying information, it's also about uh, relaying it in such a way that people want to know more. And so that's how our judges will be evaluating our contestants. And speaking of judges, I'm going to pass it along right now so that they can introduce themselves. Hello, this is Athens Clark County Mayor Kelly Gertz. I hope you are doing well. I am fortunate to be one of the three MT judges this year. Uh, in my time working with students, it's always been the case that uh, whether the, my name was that of teacher on the door or not, I actually learned more than I think the students ever did, and I expect that to be true in this project too. My name is Montu Miller and I am a community organizer, hip hop advocate, and an educator. Um, and I'm really excited about all the, the new innovations and just great ideas that are coming out these different programs and departments um, at the University of Georgia. So I'm really excited to be a judge. Hi. I'm Stuart Rayfield. I serve as the Vice Chancellor for Leadership and Institutional Development at the University System of Georgia. And I'm thrilled to have been asked uh, to be a part of the three-minute thesis competition at the University of Georgia this year. All the presentations were amazing. I learned a lot in the process, and I really appreciate the time and care each person spends on delivering their research agenda in a way that I can understand. So thanks to each of you, and I appreciate all that you do, um, and good luck. Hi, everyone. I, I, I know you, you, you'd like the competition to begin, but there's one more thing I need to remind you about, and that is that there is a People's Choice Award. So make sure you keep your eyes open for a link. That link will take you to a form where you can vote for your favorite competitor, and whoever accumulates the most votes will ultimately become our People's Choice Award. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And with that, let's go ahead and begin the competition.
You know that old saying, the devil's in the details? Well, that phrase could describe biochemistry in general, it especially applies to this slide shown. This complicated image on the left is a classic signaling pathway found in our cells, and it's taken straight from a biochemistry textbook used here at UGA. And in this case, the devil, if you will, is this little green squiggle. While this squiggle is probably overlooked by most, it turns out it has implications in diseases and decades of research behind it, making it much more complex than you would ever guess from this image. But before we look closer at the squiggle, we're first going to take a step back real quick. If you'll think back to any biology class, you may recall the central dogma of biology, where our genetic code, DNA, is transcribed to RNA, which then serves as a template to make proteins. And these proteins are the machinery that carry out all sorts of functions within our cells. But an unofficial fourth step of the central dogma is the modification of these proteins. So after they're made, proteins can have all sorts of things added to them, including lipids. And while you may be asking, what exactly is a lipid? It turns out that lipids make up all types of oils and fats that we eat, as well as things like cholesterol and our cell membranes. So in this case, our little green squiggle is a 15 carbon lipid called a farnesyl that's added to the end of certain proteins. And this farnesyl is important for the proper location and function of proteins within the cell. In fact, blocking the addition of this farnesyl has been an area of interest for treatments of things such as cancer, hepatitis, and many other diseases for years. The problem is, while originally it was thought that this farnesyl addition or farnesylation only occurred to a small group of proteins, our recent findings suggest that the rules for farnesylation are not nearly as strict, and this broadly expands the number of proteins that can undergo this modification. Additionally, while it's often taught in textbooks that the lipid acts like an anchor sticking the protein to the cell membrane, we've found that in our newly identified expanded group of farnesylated proteins, these are found all over the cell and not just at the membrane. While these are exciting new findings, they can create problems when looking at targeted therapies, as it means we don't know how many proteins are affected or the side effects may have on healthy cells. Thankfully, by combining the decades of previous research together with our newly identified proteins and a little help from technology, we've established a way to predict if proteins are likely to be farnesylated. With this in mind, my research now focuses on testing these predictions, as well as trying to understand what exactly this farnesyl is doing if it's not a lipid anchor. All in all, this misunderstood squiggle appears to be more abundant and perhaps play a different role than previously expected. So with my research, I hope to better understand why this farnesyl is so important. And remember, the next time you see a random squiggle in a textbook, don't be fooled. As you know, the devil's in the details. Think about your favorite song. And now think about why it's your favorite song. It probably has a singable melody that gets stuck in your head. The beat probably makes you want to move. The lyrics might tell a story that touches you. The harmonies might give you chills every time you listen to the song. Or you just love the sound of the synthesizer when the bass drops about a minute into the music. All of these elements are somewhat universal in Western music, and they move audiences. My name is Kelly Catlin, and I'm a flutist and composer. And these elements are in some of my favorite music as well. Electroacoustic flute music, however, which is music written for flute and electronic effects, abandoned these musical elements from the beginning. In the last 50 years, composers of electroacoustic flute repertoire sought only to subvert expectations, as opposed to writing accessible music that audiences and musicians would love. To change that, I wrote and, and recorded an album of new electroacoustic flute works. The album is titled Backstory because each piece tells a story in music and sometimes in words as well. Each piece has a singable melody, uh, accessible harmonies, a steady beat, and uses the technology available to us today. A secondary problem exists in the flute world, however. While rock and pop musicians learn how to use microphones and cables and speakers, the vast majority of flutists never do. This limits flute students' professional options in the future in the commercial music industry. And let's be honest, it also limits their potential to play music with the 
some of the elements that are in their favorite songs as well. My research addresses flutists' need for an equipment and a performance guide for electroacoustic flute repertoire. In an effort to demystify music technology, my guide offers a clear explanation about the basics, from types of microphones to equipment recommendations and stage plot templates. Pedagogically, Backstory offers a learning and a teaching opportunity. With the inspiration and the knowledge in this body of work, I hope to address the cultural longevity of the flute and to build flutist confidence to play the music that they love. Hi, my name is Patrick Doyle. I'm a PhD candidate in the psychology department and I'm gay. Some other things about me, I study celebrities, I study the internet, and I study how people like you and me connect with celebrities on the internet. All of those things will come together in the talk that I'll be giving today called Linguistic Markers of Self-Disclosure. Now, self-disclosure is a process that we all engage in whenever we share increasingly intimate information about ourselves to establish closeness with others. It's what happens on first dates, it's what happens in team building activities, and it's even sometimes how people start three minute thesis talks whenever they tell you about how they're gay. Now, the tricky part about self-disclosure is that it's kind of hard to measure. Some researchers ask questions like, hey, how much do you feel like your partner disclosed to you in this most recent conversation? But that's not measuring disclosure, that's measuring perceptions of disclosure. And perceptions are shaped by relationships. So if a stranger on the bus sits down and starts telling you about their career goals, that's really high disclosure information. But if your romantic relationship partner of six years tells you the same information, you're like, yeah, honey, I know. So I decided to study the actual content that people were disclosing, but where was I going to find this kind of information? Where do people share increasingly intimate information about themselves? The internet. About a decade ago, YouTube vloggers started sharing coming out videos in which they express their LGBTQ identities. The cool thing about vloggers is that in addition to this coming out video, they would also post regular videos like makeup tutorials or lighthearted Q&As on either side so we could actually look at what their normal level of disclosure was and how these coming out videos might be different. So I went in and grabbed the auto-generated transcript from up to five videos before and after YouTubers coming out videos. I then did some computational linguistics and I asked some of my awesome research assistants to code how much disclosure they thought were in these videos. And guess what? Our pattern worked. We found the exact same pattern where we thought that there would be a spike in these videos right at their disclosure videos. We then decided to expand our findings by retesting this, but instead of just focusing on LGBTQ coming out, we looked at how people expressed other concealable identities, like having an HIV diagnosis or having mental illness like depression or anxiety. The same pattern held. The other cool thing was that not only did our transcript measure of self-disclosure that we generated with these computational linguistics predict the amount of likes and comments each video received, it also predicted the amount of disclosure that was in the over half a million comments that we also downloaded from these same videos. Self-disclosure is an incredibly important process in social and personality psychology, and this is a really great study for helping move forward a new measure of doing so. After all, these YouTubers were doing exactly what YouTube tells you to do. Broadcast yourself. Thank you. The United States is undergoing a racial reckoning. And one of the primary tools Americans often use to learn about racial injustice is the media. Following the murder of George Floyd on May 25th, 2020, many Americans turned to mediated platforms like HBO and Netflix to educate themselves about systemic racism. Americans turned to media during this time is actually of no surprise, as Americans spend approximately 732 minutes per day engaging in media consumption. Therefore, it's easy to see that mediated texts like music, television, film, and documentaries have the potential to play a critical role in shaping public thought, discourse, and behavior, which is foundational to my field of rhetorical studies. But what does it mean to study rhetoric? Well, to put it simply, I study the persuasive verbal and visual elements found within different forms of Black popular culture. And in doing so, I critically analyze how these forms of persuasive messaging influence and transform our understandings of both race and power on a societal level. 
I view black popular culture as a sort of counter doctrine that teaches us new ways of being, thinking, seeing, and imagining, making it an incredibly powerful and persuasive tool for both education and for transformation. Entertainment texts like hip hop music, film, and television have often served as cultural interventions to expand public discourse on issues like police brutality and the criminal justice system. And in a similar way, my research stands as an extension of this as I analyze entertainment texts produced during the Black Lives Matter movement. My scholarship aims to offer a sort of guidebook of rhetorical strategies that disrupt, uncover, and combat systems of whiteness in America. Whiteness, a rhetorical theory, simply refers to the processes that uphold white supremacy. Whiteness does not only necessarily operate in the overt sense, like through racist organizations such as the KKK, but often takes shape in invisible forms like that of white fragility, which continue to uphold systemic inequality. My research aims to inquire, first, what strategies are black artists using to uncover, disrupt, and combat whiteness in America? And lastly, how can we use these strategies in our everyday lives to combat whiteness? In doing so, I argue that these strategies have the potential to extend beyond the screen and offer us new ways of thinking, seeing, and being, which hold incredible symbolic and material consequences for black folks in America, influencing not only how they're viewed, but how they're treated. Identifying rhetorical strategies within music videos like Childish Gambino's This Is America, the documentary The Apollo, or the film Get Out will not change people overnight, nor will it alone repair America. However, recognizing and understanding these rhetorical strategies are necessary steps to move us towards racial reconciliation in the United States. Thank you. Raise your hand if you have been a volunteer and keep raising your hand if you became a volunteer because you wanted to learn something new. Okay, I see some of you are probably putting your hands down. It is true that learning is rarely considered as a motivation for volunteering because of volunteering's emphasis on doing and providing services. But there is little doubt that individual benefits from volunteering and the impact could be long-lasting. The benefits are usually unintended consequences of their behavior. This is called informal and incidental learning, the learning without the curriculum. Before coming to UGA, I volunteered for two years in adult English at the second language program in Philadelphia, working with newly arrived immigrants and refugees. If we consider immigrant integration as a two-way process, then what does this process look like from the host community's perspective? My dissertation looks at the informal and incidental learning of volunteers in adult ESL. As a member of the host community, what did the volunteers learn as they engaged in intercultural interactions with immigrants and refugees, and how is this learning related to their intercultural maturity? I began my data collection in January 2020, right before the outbreak of the pandemic in the United States. Many adult ESL programs were forced to shut down. And I was overwhelmed by the generosity of adult ESL volunteers in Georgia and around the country. I received 200 responses and conducted 12 interviews. The analysis showed that informal and incidental learning is the principal way for volunteers to learn in adult ESL. Volunteers considered learning from teaching as the most important source of informal learning. Teaching in adult ESL presents plenty of learning triggers often in the form of a surprising or unexpected event growing out of interaction with students. For example, how would you respond when you heard your students took touch base very literally and waited for her boss in the basement for two hours? In addition, the study found that volunteers expanded their knowledge about the immigrant experience, engaged in reflection on their identity and privilege, and developed a deeper commitment to social actions. This study confirmed that adult ESL is an intercultural learning space, not only for the students, but also for the volunteers. Now, the pandemic has greatly disrupted our understanding of work and learning. This time of uncertainty and complexity calls for greater capacity to learn and adapt, which is mostly in an informal and incidental way. I hope this study can contribute to the recognition of learning through volunteering and informal and incidental learning in our everyday life. Remember, there is no curriculum in our life.
Picture this. It's March 2020, and you've just found out that your state is going into COVID quarantine. You head to the grocery store to pick up some essentials for your two weeks of lockdown, only to find that the shelves are barren and customers are fighting over toilet paper. This is what life is like every day for a microorganism that resides within the first chamber of the cow's stomach, called the rumen. In the rumen, there are bacteria, archaea, protozoa, and fungi that are constantly competing for nutrients and space. Each of these microorganisms has its own role. Some degrade starch, some degrade fiber, some degrade anything in between. But where do they get these nutrients from? The animal, of course. Every time we feed ruminant animals, like cattle, we're really feeding their microbial population which in turn provides energy that that host animal can absorb and use. This is why scientists are starting to think that if we can manipulate the microbial population within the rumen, then we can potentially alter the host animal's feed efficiency. Feed efficiency is how much feed an animal intakes versus how much that animal gains. So an animal that's really, really feed efficient will intake less but gain just as much as its next door neighbor who may not be as efficient. For my study, we selected 12 beef cattle who were bred to be really efficient and 12 who were bred to be really inefficient. We then fed each of these animals one of two diets. The first diet was a hay diet and was fed to half the animals. The second diet was a grain diet and was fed to the other half of the animals. These animals were individually fed for 28 days. After 28 days, they were transitioned over to the alternate diets. So those that started on grain finished on hay, and those that started on hay finished on grain. During these feeding periods, we calculated animal feed intake data as well as body weight. We even took samples from the rumen and feces. The rumen and fecal samples will be analyzed to figure out which microbial populations were present and how much energy was available to that animal. This could potentially answer the question of, what's most important when it comes to beef cattle feed efficiency? Is it genetics? Is it diet? Or is it the gastrointestinal microbial population? Thank you. Do you remember the story of the Grinch? This mean guy that wants to ruin Christmas for everyone? Well, imagine him going to the North Pole during Christmas season to hypnotize the elves and make them build only the gifts that he wants for himself. If the Grinch were to do this, he would have to figure out a way to get into the elves' workshop, hypnotize the elves, and leave with all his gifts in the most effective and sneaky way possible. For example, he could use a costume to blend in with the other elves when they come in and out of the workshop. Well, this is basically what viruses do. Viruses use different processes to go inside the cells, use the cell equipment to replicate and exit out of the cells to then continue the cycle of infection. Many viruses take advantage of components in the cell membrane to help their exit. For example, the cell membrane contains fat molecules that are called lipids, which have a waxy or oily consistency such as butter. As you can imagine, the specific location of these lipids or fats give the membrane extra fluidity and can cause curvatures in the cells that allow things to easily get in and out of the cells. Some viruses can use the location of these fats to their advantage to get out of the cells in a more subtle way, like the Grinch exiting through a revolving door in the workshop. In my case, my project focuses on understanding if the vesicular stomatitis virus, or VSV, takes advantage of the location of these revolving doors or fats like PS to get out of the cells. VSV is a virus that is commonly used for the development of vaccines because it can infect a lot of different types of cells without causing any human disease. In fact, vaccines have been developed modifying this virus to produce an immune response that is specific against Ebola or HIV. However, even though this virus has been well studied, 
we still don't know much about which components are important for this virus to get out of the cells. Therefore, understanding more of how this Grinch gets in and out of the workshop will provide more insight into his master plan and will allow Santa or scientists to use this plan for our advantage, leading to enhancements of vaccines that are already available and the development of better future vaccines. But where are you really from? When Latinos or Hispanics are asked a xenophobic question, it stings because it assumes that their skin pigmentation, Spanish surname, or spicy food are incompatible with being American. Living with dueling and complex, hyphenated identities is a reality of most non-white ethnic groups in the U.S., and Latinos or Hispanics are no different. Being both Hispanic and American is difficult enough, but what about being Hispanic American and Southern? Is it possible to be a Southern Latino? If so, what does a Southern Latino sound like? This is where my research, the Latino Voices in Georgia project, comes in. It's the first study on Latino English in Georgia. Though it's been studied extensively in traditional Latino communities across the U.S., such as California, Texas, or New York, its development in new destinations like Georgia is yet to be documented. You may be wondering what Latino English is. We know from previous studies that it's not Spanish-accented English nor imperfect English. Speakers of Latino English may not even speak Spanish, and if they do, their English isn't somehow messed up by it. They speak English natively, just like any other American. Latino English is what's known as an ethnolect, or a dialect of English spoken by a particular ethnic group, and in this case, those with Hispanic roots. I developed an audio survey where Latinos from Georgia record themselves answering questions about what it's like living in Georgia and what it means to be both Latino and Southern. They talk about moments when they've been discriminated against because of being Latino, and they share the ways in which growing up in the South has changed the way they see the world. With these audio recordings, I'm able to acoustically analyze and code their speech to find out which linguistic features they are using and which identity markers they point to. Preliminarily, I found that speakers tend to fall somewhere on a split dialect continuum, depending upon where they're from in Georgia, their community orientation, and their rootedness. Speakers either diverge towards Standard American English or Southern American English. Rural speakers who are really connected to their Latino heritage and feel rooted in Georgia tend to use a mixture of Southern and Latino features. On the other hand, urban speakers who have less contact with the Latino community and more mobility tend to sound almost nondescript, with their Latinidad or Latinoness hiding in more subtle features like their pronunciation of the word Latino. Embedded in this dialect continuum is an identity continuum, where the most um, Latino features index the strength of a person's Latinidad. It's at the forefront of their identity, something they think about and face every day. On the other hand, the use of more Southern English features points to a, not a lack of Latinidad, but instead to a deep connection to the similarities between Southerners and Latinos, like their hospitality, faith, family ties, and community bonds. Lastly, it seems that the use of Standard English indicates more upward mobility in education, jobs, or location. These speakers tend to focus on the global rather than the local. The biggest takeaway thus far is that Latinos don't all sound the same and that doesn't make them any less Latino, Southern, or American. We're getting to hear this ethnolect unfold in real time, which is why my research is so vital. If we don't document this now, we'll miss out on the nuances of Southern Latino voices and identities. As we age, an important part of our social development stems from our ability to recognize and respond to authority, be it from our parents, our teachers, bosses, and more. However, there's a dark side to adherence to authority. And if one follows the winding road of obedience far enough, you will stumble into some of the most horrific massacres of the modern age. My name is Nathan Rothenbaum. I'm a PhD candidate in communication studies, and my research examines what scholars call the superior orders defense. Broadly, this refers to any appeal that sounds something like I was just following orders. As a scholar of rhetoric, my research is both practical and ethical. Practically, I wanna know when is this appeal persuasive? When is it successful? And ethically, I wanna know what consequences stem from either accepting or rejecting this appeal. As part of a generous research grant awarded by the Wilson Center, I looked into the court martial of Lieutenant William Kelly Jr., the only American found responsible for the May Lai Massacre, a horrific war crime perpetrated by American soldiers that claimed the lives of 502 Vietnamese civilians. Using archival transcripts from the trial, 
I closely examined the persuasive strategies of both the prosecution and the defense. My findings were both encouraging and worrying. They were encouraging because the evidence suggests that the public at large largely rejected the defense's appeals. That's encouraging for us today because it means there is ample space in both public and legal spheres to hold accountable those that abuse their power and privileges. At the same time, it is worrying. It's worrying because in rejecting Kelly's defense of superior orders, the state functionally exonerated every other participant in the massacre, either directly through plea deals or indirectly by refusing to investigate the other cases. In the end, Kelly was found guilty of killing 22 Vietnamese civilians. That is less than 5% of the total deaths from the massacre. In rejecting Kelly's defense of superior orders, we were functionally forced to accept the state's version of events, that the massacre was the result of one single bad apple, not bad military policy. These findings suggest that for us today, we have to tread carefully in deciding what to do with the superior orders defense. We shouldn't let it totally exonerate those that do great harm. At the same time, we can't directly reject it either, lest we protect the very machine that gave the order. We're all familiar with origami, the art of folding paper into beautiful shapes. But nature has been using this technique for billions of years. Nature has used origami with proteins. Just as a simple piece of paper can be folded into a beautiful crane, a simple strand of protein can be folded into a complex three-dimensional shape with biological functions. Hi everyone, my name is Arya Venkat and I study protein folding, specifically a class of proteins called glycosyl transferases or sugar building enzymes. They're responsible for making all sugars in cells from simple ones like the ones you find in fruits to complex ones like starch and bread. So why are they important? Well, they're implicated in a variety of diseases from Alzheimer's to muscular dystrophies. They're also of interest to the field of bioenergy, specifically creating plant biofuels and other green energies. A little bit about proteins. Proteins are composed of a string of units called amino acids. Depending on the order and types of amino acids, the final shape of the protein at the end can change. It's like how changing the size of the paper or steps in the origami folding process is going to affect the shape of the origami figure you produce at the end. So to study these proteins, I run sophisticated computer simulations to see how these proteins move. Just like a paper crane can have its wings folded up or down to simulate flying, folding motions in the protein structure allow us to hypothesize about its function. So currently, I'm studying how the motions in the core of these enzymes influence its function in building sugars. The core of the enzyme heavily stays the same through evolution, so any changes we see in the core is going to have big implications on how the protein functions, like what types of sugars get built, whether they're big or small and how they're built, below, on top, on the sides. Diseases can take advantage of this by making key mutations to regulate these protein functions to their favor. Our knowledge about these dynamics in protein folding is going to allow us to design completely artificial proteins with unique functions we've created. That's the subject of my next study, to engineer an artificial sugar building enzyme. The construction of an artificial enzyme will propel new solutions for therapeutics and bioenergy alternatives. Thus, learning from nature's evolutionary origami, we are beginning to fold new shapes. Hi, I'm David Lee. I'm the Vice President for Research. I would like to thank each and every one of the students who just gave those presentations. They were absolutely terrific. Thank you. Also, they were nicely representative of the diversity of topics and disciplines at this comprehensive uh, university. The Office of Research is proud to uh, partner with the Graduate School in order to sponsor this event. 
After all, graduate students are the lifeblood of the research enterprise. We wouldn't have a research enterprise without graduate students. And we also think that this is a highly worthwhile event. So we're very glad to be part of it. Uh, and once again, uh, my congratulations to the students who just gave those uh, wonderful presentations. And now without any further ado, I'll turn this over to Dean Walcott who will announce the winners. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And thanks to the Office of Research for co-sponsoring this year's 3MT competition. This year, it was particularly exciting to see our competitors representing a wide range of disciplines. I am very proud of how our students performed. They are a true testament to the quality of our graduate programs at UGA. At this time, I want to remind the audience of the prizes our students are competing for. The 3MT winner will receive $1,000, the runner will receive $750, and the People's Choice Award winner will receive $500. Additionally, each winner will receive a plaque, and their names will be engraved on another plaque that will remain in the graduate school. So, with no further ado, I will announce the winners. The runner up in the 2021 3MT competition is Shannon Rodriguez, whose presentation was entitled, But Where Are You Really From? The Southern Latino's Linguistic Identity. Shannon is in the Department of Linguistics and she is supervised by Dr. Chad Howe. Congratulations to Shannon and Dr. Howe. The 2021 3MT competition winner is Judith Reyes Ballista, whose presentation was entitled, Viruses, the Grinch of the Cells. Judith is in the Department of Infectious Diseases and she is supervised by Dr. Melinda Brindley. Congratulations to Judith and Dr. Brindley. In addition to our winners, I want to congratulate all of our wonderful competitors and their supervisors. I also want to thank you, our audience, for tuning in to the finals of the 2021 3MT competition. At this time, I will turn you over to our Master of Ceremonies, Mr. James Hathaway. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and congratulations to our winners. I want to remind everybody that the People's Choice Award is still open, so make sure you vote for your favorite contestant and we'll announce the winner of that on our websites and our social media tomorrow. So in the meantime, everyone stay safe. Look forward to seeing you again very soon. Take care.